a top-ranking Soviet spy turned double agent for British intelligence. A high-stakes MI6 extraction that whisked him away from the KGB and into hiding. Sounds like the plot of a blockbuster film. But it is the true story of a man whose actions may well have been instrumental in ending the Cold War. That according to author and historian Ben McIntyre. He tells it all in his new book, The Spy and the Traitor, the greatest espionage story of the Cold War. He is a writer at large for the Times of London and author of several best-selling works of historical nonfiction. And Ben McIntyre joins us now for more. Great to have you in that chair. Thank you for having me. Let us tell the story. This is a man that I suspect a lot of people have not heard of, but who was, as you point out, uh, crucial to where we are today in history. Who was Oleg Gordievsky? Well, I mean, he has a decent claim to be the most important spy of the Cold War. I mean, he's, he's one of a very small handful of spies that actually changed the course of history. I mean, he managed... He was a, he was a senior KGB colonel who, for 12 years, spied for British intelligence, information that was going through to America, through to the CIA, that actually cracked open the innermost workings of the Kremlin at a critical moment in the Cold War saga. And in 1985, when, when his story comes to this rather dramatic ending, by that point, I mean, his information was going straight into the sort of policymakers' baskets. And you talked to him? Oh, yeah, many times. He still lives in a, in a safe house in, in Britain, where he's been now for three decades. He's under very close protection these days. His neighbours have no idea who he is. He lives under an assumed name. He lives, in fact, under an execution order. I mean, he was tried in absentia in Soviet Russia when he, when he escaped. And that execution order remains in, 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 in force. Spies don't normally give media interviews. Why do you think he talked to you? Well, it's a good question. It, I wouldn't say it was really a media interview. I got to know him over a long, long period. I probably have about 140 hours of taped interviews with him. Oleg's now 80 years old. He's, um, he's very keen to tell his story. He, I think he wants to sort of unburden himself in some ways of this extraordinary saga of which he was the sort of central player. It is extraordinary because he's not just... He, he isn't just a former KGB agent, but he came from a KGB family. And let's just do a little excerpt here from the book to set this up. Oppressive, mysterious and ubiquitous, the KGB penetrated and controlled every aspect of Soviet life. It rooted out internal dissent, guarded the communist leadership, mounted espionage and counterintelligence operations against enemy powers, and cowed the peoples of the USSR into abject obedience. It recruited agents and planted spies worldwide, gathering, buying and stealing military, political and scientific secrets from anywhere and everywhere. At the height of its power, with more than one million officers, agents and informants, the KGB shaped Soviet society more profoundly than any other institution. I thought we had to put that on the record because, you know, young people just, they don't know, right? Absolutely. They didn't grow up during the Cold War. Ooh. So tell us, for starters, what was it like for him to grow up in a quote-unquote KGB family? Well, I mean, Oleg Gordievsky was a pure product of the KGB, if you like. Uh, his father had been in the KGB. Uh, his brother was a KGB officer. He grew up in a special KGB compound eating KGB food. <laughs> you know, literally, I mean, he, was, he, he came sort of fully formed out of this organisation. I mean, we see the KGB today as this sort of vast paranoid, brutal, monstrous instrument of a repression, which it was in many ways. But if you were sufficiently ambitious and sufficiently talented uh, in the Soviet Union, you aspired to join the KGB. It was an elite force. And Oleg, at least initially, when he joined the KGB, that's exactly how he saw it. Although he didn't get off to the greatest start, right? What happened on his first posting? <laughs> well, his first posting was to, was to Denmark. Um, and he... Uh, it, it, that was his first foreign posting. Foreign posting yeah. But before that, he'd spent a lot of time in Moscow creating identities for other spies. Um, he, he did what he's called... He was in Section S, it was called, Directorate S. And what they did was to create false identities for civilian spies and implant them around the globe in different places. And they were known as illegals. And for Oleg, that was a very frustrating period where he was sort of sitting in Moscow. But he did then eventually get his break and was sent to, uh, sent to Denmark. And follow up on the story. What happened in Denmark? Well, I mean... I mean, initially, of course, he was still a purely loyal KGB officer. I mean, he was, he was a, you know, he, there was no question that he was ever going to, to sort of desert and change sides, although the seeds of it were there, Steve. You could tell there were elements in him that were beginning to rebel. For example, he had witnessed the building of the Berlin Wall, and that, cre that had a profound impact on him. Uh, and it was a kind of physical proof, if you like, of the way Europe was being divided in two by this kind of brutal ideology. And then another key moment for him came while he was in Denmark when the Prague Spring, the great reform movement in Czechoslovakia, was crushed by the Soviet Union. 1968. 1968. And he was 
personally outraged by that. And that was, in a way, the pivot mo moment for Oleg. Here's another excerpt from the book. Why does anyone spy? Why give up the security of family, friends, and a regular job for the perilous twilight world of secrets? Why in particular would someone join one intelligence service and then switch loyalty to an imposing one? Gordievsky had joined the KGB as a loyal Soviet citizen, never imagining that he might one day betray it. What ultimately, in your judgment, drove him to switch sides? Oleg is, again, one of the very few spies I've ever come across who is almost entirely driven by ideology. Spies come in all sorts of shapes and sizes, and often the motivations are very varied. Romance, adventure, money, blackmail. You know, there are lots of reasons, damage, you know, personal, personal problems that make them vulnerable to recruitment. Oleg is different. I mean, he took an intellectual decision that the, that the regime he was serving was illegal and philistine and brutal. Astonishing he could come to that conclusion, given his background. Absolutely. But he's a highly intelligent man, Oleg, and he, in a way he's a student of, of humanity, if you like. I mean, when he was in Denmark, he had access to, to books and magazines and newspapers that he'd never have been able to read in, in the Soviet Union. And he, he approached it almost in a sort of... as an intellectual, really, and he, he sort of began to break down what he saw as the communist state and arrived at the conclusion that he needed... And he's no... You know, this, in a way, you could see it as, a, as an act of sort of vanity, in a way. He believed he could materially help to destroy this machine. And he was right about that. He was right about that, out. eventually. Yeah. 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 Uh, I don't want to give away too much of the plot here, but I think our viewers would be interested to hear, you know, who approached whom and how did the Brits eventually turn him, or was he for the... You know, go into some of that, if you would. Well, it, it was a very elaborate courtship, if you like. It, would, it took a very long time. There were signals, there were signs to the West that Oleg seemed to be someone who might be available for hire. And so uh, the head of the MI6 in Copenhagen approached him very discreetly and invited him to lunch, and they began a kind of a long, complicated dance around each other. In fact, it was so subtle that at one point the MI6 officer sent a, sent a cable back to London saying, good God, I think Oleg Gordievsky is trying to recruit me. I mean, they could, he literally couldn't work out which way it was going. But eventually Oleg, by a series of subtle signals, indicated that he was ready to start passing information. And yet he reported that lunch back to his KGB minders. That was his cover. He knew that if he'd been spotted mm. seeing the MI6 officer, he'd be in real... Tr if he hadn't reported it to his mm. KGB officers, his bosses, he'd be in real trouble. So the cover that he gave them was that he was sort of sounding out this other character, this MI6 officer, with a possible view to recruitment. So there was something in the file which became very important later on hmm. that indicated that, uh, that Oleg had indeed met with British intelligence. And what kind of information did he eventually provide to MI6? Well, uh, in the Copenhagen period, and we're now talking sort of early 70s, he was producing information that was identifying um, Soviet recruited agents in the West. Westerners who were on the KGB payroll, who were providing often very important information of a very elevated sort, back to Moscow. So, effectively, he was rooting out spies in the West. And the KGB had no clue for the longest time that he was doing this. Absolutely none Why not? at all. I mean, that's their, that's their stock and trade, right? Yep, absolutely. Well, it's the old story, isn't it? I mean, Oleg's tradecraft was very, very good. I mean, he covered his tracks brilliantly. He was trained in this stuff. He knew how to get to the safe house. He knew how to shake off surveillance. He knew how to cover what he was up to. And he was, as I say, extremely good at it. Hmm. He used to every day, and uh, not every day, but sort of every week from the Copenhagen Soviet embassy, he would extract the microfilm on which the instructions from Moscow would arrive, these long strips of sort of plastic microfilm. He would simply smuggle them out of the embassy, hand them over to his MI6 handler at a special sort of brush contact site, as it's called in, in, in spy jargon. He'd hand over these things. They would copy them using a very special, sophisticated machine that MI6 had developed. Then he'd take the, the microfilm back. Then he'd have to get back to the embassy. And all of that had to be done in about 40 minutes, uh, knowing that if he made a single mistake, I mean, if he slipped up in any way, mm -hmm. the KGB would be onto him and he would be arrested, taken back to Moscow, tortured and then executed. I mean, the stakes were incredibly high. And we should remember, he was married, he had children at the time as well, so... He did. The implications so, for his family would have been significant as well. Absolutely. And, of course, his wife, who herself was the daughter of two KGB officers, had no idea what he was doing. I mean, well, she was that, never privy to his secrets. That, that's what you tell us. You're convinced that's the case. Oh, yes. I, I'm convinced <laughs> she didn't know. Uh, another interesting part of the relationship between Gordievsky and MI6 is that as this, as this exchange of information continues, 
it seems like they all become kind of friendly. Is that what normally happens? Yes. I mean, it's one of the interesting things about spying is that the relationship between a spy and a spy master becomes very emotional often and very intense. In fact, I've never come across a spy who didn't feel that their relationship with their handler, if you like, was more than just a kind of marriage of convenience. <laughs> uh, it becomes a quite intense secret bond. And MI6 was very good at putting the right people to run Oleg Gordievsky, people who would appreciate his intellectual, his intellectual aspirations, people who kind of understood how he worked. And to this day, the people who Oleg sees most of in his safe house in, in Britain are his former MI6 handlers. Hmm. Isn't that interesting? There was, I, I mean, we're about the same age here, and I don't know about you, but when, I mean, when we were growing up, there were tens of thousands of missiles from both sides pointed at each other, and it was possible when we went to bed that we might not get up the next morning because you thought World War III might break out. I mean, the Cold War, for our younger viewers, was pretty bloody intense. The Soviets were convinced at one point that America was about to launch a first strike. What was Gordievsky's role in either convincing them that it was or wasn't going to happen? Gordievsky was absolutely central to that. One of, the, one of the key bits of evidence of information that he brought to the West was the fact that there was something called Operation Rian going on, which was a KGB programme to try to establish when and whether the West would, would launch a first strike, would press the button first. And what Oleg was able to reveal uh, to London and then latterly to Washington was that the Soviet leadership was genuinely fearful that this would happen. They were hearing Reagan's rhetoric about the evil empire, and they believed that the West was going to attack first. Now, this came as a huge shock to Washington and London. I mean, the idea that the Russians might, the Soviets might genuinely believe that the West was going to start this war came as a kind of complete revelation. And actually, they began to ratchet down the rhetoric. You can see a, a very significant change in the way America was talking to, to, to Moscow. And, and that is related entirely, not entirely, but largely to what Oleg, the information Oleg was, was producing. So you begin to see the beginning of the end of the Cold War. And Gordievsky is absolutely central to that. He, he actually is, is really changing the course of history. Well, let's do a follow on that. Um, again, people of a certain age will remember your former Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher, and this new dynamic, much younger Soviet leader, Mikhail Gorbachev, meeting for the first time. Mrs. Thatcher saying, I like Mr. Gorbachev, I think we can do business together. Gordievsky's involvement in that relationship and what his information might have led to. Help us well, with that. this is um, the later part of the story. By this point, Oleg has become a KGB officer based in London. And in fact, by the end of his posting in London, and we're now getting to 1984, he was appointed head of the KGB in London. So he quite literally had the key to the safe. He was able to tell Britain exactly what the KGB was doing in Britain. So when Gorbachev, the rising star of the Politburo, arrived for his first visit, one of Oleg's jobs as this very senior KGB officer was to brief the young Gorbachev on what he should say to Thatcher. And he produced these very complex, very detailed briefing notes. But, of course, those briefing notes were actually written by British intelligence. Mm. So you have a unique situation <laughs> here where one spy is briefing both sides. He's telling Thatcher what to say to Gorbachev, and he's telling Gorbachev what to say to Thatcher. So when she emerged from those meetings saying, this is a man we can do business with, one of the reasons they could do business was because Oleg Gordievsky was rigging the business. Now, but now, Gorbachev clearly did not know this. Did Mrs Thatcher know this? Uh, she was aware. She, was, she knew of Gordievsky's existence. She knew that the British had a high-level spy within the KGB. She did not know his name. In fact, she always referred to him as Mr. Collins. Mr. Collins, yes. Yeah, I mean, why? We've never been able to work out. It was, wasn't until many years, many years later that, that she actually discovered the whole Gordievsky case. But she did care about him, didn't she? Oh, very much so. And she felt an intense personal loyalty to this person she'd never met. She understood... I mean, she didn't really approve of spies, Margaret Thatcher. She thought the whole thing was slightly grubby. But she did understand that, that Gordievsky was, was taking an amazing... Or Mr. Collins, as she knew him, mm. was taking an amazing risk. Now, let's get to the title of the book for a second, because The Spy and the Traitor, one could infer that you're talking about the same person here. I mean, Gordievsky was a spy, and to Russia, Soviet Union then, he clearly was a traitor. Uh, not so, though. Who's the traitor you're referring to? Well, no, I mean... Or I guess it's a double entendre. It's a double entendre. Yes. I mean, I'm rather intended it to yeah. be that. I okay. mean, spies are traitors. I mean, you know, treachery, deception lies at the very heart of this job. You are trying to get 
people to deceive their own countries. And so, yes, it's an intended double entendre, but more straightforwardly, it refers to a particular American individual. I said to you earlier that information was being passed on to the CIA by MI6. Now, under, under in, uh, international rules, conventions, if you're passing information to an ally, you don't tend to reveal the source. Mm. You may say what level it comes from, how reliable it is, uh, and particularly between Britain and America, there's a very close intelligence sharing um, uh, relationship, but the Brits would never tell the Americans where this stuff was coming from. And of course, the CIA doesn't really like that. The CIA <laughs> likes to know where everything comes from. Uh, and also, it's not a great look if you're the head of the CIA and you're going into the Oval Office and saying, Mr. President, we've got great information, but we don't really know where it's coming from. So the CIA launched its own internal investigation to try to identify who the Brits had. They did this completely secretly. They didn't tell MI6 they were doing it. And there is still considerable rancour within British intelligence that this was done. It, was a, it wasn't exactly a breaking of the rules, but it, was, it really wasn't playing fair either. And they worked it out. The CIA did work it out. They, they, it took them a long time, and it was a very clever piece of investigation. But what the, what the Americans didn't know was that their head of Soviet counterintelligence, a man called Aldrich Ames, was about to go over to the KGB. And not for any of the sort of ideological reasons that Gordievsky uh, fashioned himself after. This was a straight money play, right? This was money. I mean, Aldrich Ames, Rick Ames, wanted cash. Uh, he wanted a bigger car, he wanted a nicer apartment, and he was kind of, frankly, he felt he'd been overlooked within the CIA. He was a long-term veteran. And so uh, he did it for money. I mean, he, he, he was quite open about that uh, when he was finally caught. He certainly wasn't at the time, but he did it for, he did it for the cash. And he fingered Gordievsky? Almost certainly. He certainly identified him by name a little later on in the saga. What happened was that in May 1985, Aldrich James approached the Soviet um, embassy in Washington, D.C. He knew who the head of the KGB was there, and he, he gave them a whole load of information and, and got the first down payment in cash on what would eventually be millions of dollars in payments. And within 24 hours of that approach, Oleg Gordievsky was recalled to Moscow. Uh, and, and went. I mean, shockingly. It was a big debate within MI6 about whether he should go or not. Um, there, he had now been, as I say, appointed head of the KGB in London, but he hadn't been formally anointed. And so the message that came from Moscow was, we need to, you know, to, to, to do a sort of, as it were, a formal laying on of hands for this, which was part of the KGB tradition. So there was a, ostensibly a good reason for him to go back. There was a big debate within MI6 about whether he should go or not. There were voices saying, look, Gordievsky has done noble work for us. He should be allowed to stand down now, go into permanent retirement under a different identity. In the West. In the West, in, in Britain. I mean, he wanted to stay in Britain. Or he thought he would stay in Britain eventually. Other voices were saying, we're about to hit the jackpot here. You know, this is not the moment to step away from the roulette table. We need like, one more throw of the dice. Send him back and he can send be more Send him back helpful. in and, he, and, 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 you know, there is a good ostensible reason for him going. That debate, believe it or not, still continues uh, within MI6. There is still considerable debate about whether or not he should go back. In the end, it was Oleg himself who made the decision personally, uh, and enormous courage, really, mm -hmm. that he decided he would go back. Well, it did affect his health. It did affect his, I mean, mental, physical, mm -hmm. in every which way, because going back also meant... If they're on to me, I'm dead. Yeah. How did he handle all of that? Oleg is an extraordinary man. I mean, he has this kind of raw Slavic courage, if you like. I mean, he, I think he thought the chances of him getting away with it, the chances of it being an ambush, were about 70%. Hmm. But he thought it was still worth taking the gamble because for the 30% chance that it would come off. And he was a man of great sort of rigorous... Duty, really. I mean, he felt it was, it, was, it was incumbent on him, in a way, to do it. Mm. The minute he got back to Moscow, I mean, the minute he went to his apartment uh, and found that he couldn't open the door because a lock that he never used had been locked, and that could only mean that the KGB had been inside his apartment, from that moment, he knew he was a marked man. One of, one of the uh, funniest lines in the book, if I can put it that way, is when they take the KGB take his wife aside, mm. and they are interrogating her because they're convinced she's in on it with him. Yeah. And she tries to disabuse them of that notion. Do you remember the line she used? I'm trying to remember what I wrote. Now, what, <laughs> now, what, what is now that I've asked it, I'm saying, <laughs> I say, well, she, she said, wait a second, I was his wife. <laughs> That's right. right. I, I mean, I, I did his laundry, I cooked his food, I raised his kids, 
you guys are in the spying business. How is it I'm supposed to know who he was and Absolutely. you didn't? No, yeah. and she had yeah. a very good point. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's a great point. She said, you know, <laughs> you, are, you are supposed to be catching spies. That's your job. <laughs> I'm a wife. Why didn't you spot him? I mean, as in all totalitarian regimes, guilt by association works very strongly. They assumed she must be in on the plot. She absolutely wasn't. She had no idea that he was a double agent working with British intelligence, which, of course... Mm is a deception. I mean, the truth is their marriage was built in some ways on a deception. Before they ever even got together, he was already working for the British and he never told her. And therefore we should not be surprised that the marriage did not survive. It did not. No, it's a long... And, and indeed, it's a very sad story in many ways. It, there's a human cost to these stories. Mm -hmm. They're not simple black-and-white moral fables in which the good people always win and the bad people always lose. It, it's much greyer than that. And mm -hmm. both Oleg and his, his now ex-wife, Leila, have paid a heavy price for this. Yeah. In our remaining moments here, uh, Ben, let's talk... Uh, let's bring it to today. Do you know whether Vladimir Putin has it out for Gordievsky? Well... Vladimir Putin was a young KGB officer in 1985 when Oleg escaped from the, from the Soviet Union. And, and that was a scandal within the KGB. I mean, it caused an enormous explosion. And a lot of uh, Putin's immediate bosses and patrons were fired as a result. So it is said that Putin himself may have a personal animus against, against Gordievsky. I'm not sure if that's true. He certainly has a, a deep loathing for people that he regards as traitors. Do you know whether the file, though, would still be open and that, and, and that the, uh, the successor of the KGB would still be interested in tracking him down and, and bring him, in their I, view, to justice? Who knows? I mean, that's, that is, it is such an opaque world, uh, the world of, of that area of Soviet intelligence. What we do know is that the execution order that was passed on Oleg all those years ago, more than 30 years ago, remains in force. It's never been rescinded. So Oleg knows about living with the threat of of assassination. That is really what he's lived with for more than three decades now. So, but he, as I say, he's a man who has looked at death. He's looked at it very closely. During his escape from the Soviet Union, he knew that there was a high probability he was going to die. So in a way, death for him, you know, that threat of death is not new. But interestingly, I mean, after the attempted assassination of Sergei Skripal in, in Salisbury in Britain last March, um, the protection around Oleg Gordievsky has been increased hugely. I mean, he is now under very, very tight security. So he can't really lead a, I mean, anything close to a normal life, right? Can't, can't, no. Can't go where he wants, when he wants, do no. what he wants, no. In some ways, Oleg is, uh, and I use the word advisedly, he's a prisoner of history. Mm -hmm. I mean, he, he cannot leave his house without protection. He cannot live under his own name, you know. But I've never heard him utter a single word of regret. Hmm. The KGB, of course, uh, no longer exists under that name. It has successor organizations. Do, can you tell us whether those successor organizations have the same place in today's Russia as the KGB did in the former Soviet Union? Not quite. I mean, uh, they are different organizations, really. They're split into, into, into different parts. The element of internal security that was so much part of the KGB world, the watching world where everybody was watching everybody else and prepared to betray everybody else and indeed to identify spies within the, whether or not they really existed, I don't think that element of the, of the sort of KGB system still exists. On the other hand, as I say, Putin is an ex-KGB officer. A lot of what he believes are the sort of elements of, of, of power come straight from the KGB playbook. I mean, we talk about fake news, we talk about, you know, the, the sort of confusion of the West, we talk about the attempts to, to, to have an impact on, on Western elections. These were all things that the KGB would... These were things that Oleg was trained to do in the 1970s and was under orders to do in the 1980s. I mean, specifically, one of his jobs when he came to Britain in the early 80s was to try to disrupt the election was to try to ensure that the candidate that the KGB wanted, which was, of course, the left-wing candidate, would win and that Margaret Thatcher would lose. So the idea that somehow uh, interfering with elections is, is something that only happens in modern <laughs> times is not right. Right. Uh, let's finish on this, Ben. He, he, he desperately wanted to see the end of the Soviet Union, and it happened. When's the last time he was in Russia? The last time he was in Russia was when he was in the boot of a car being driven across the Finnish border in the escape attempt that, that he made in 1985. 1985. He, he has never set foot in Russia since. And he couldn't. I mean, he would be, he would be under extreme danger to do no, so. I appreciate that he couldn't. Do you know in any of your conversations with him, though, whether he wishes he could? 
He says he doesn't want to. He says he has left that part of his life behind, that he is a British citizen now, that he feels intensely patriotic about Britain. That said, I think there is, as in all Russians, there is a wistfulness uh, for his homeland. Oleg would, would, would strongly insist that he is a patriotic Russian, that what he did was not uh, in opposition to his, to his homeland. What he, did, he, was, he was fighting the system. He was not fighting Russia. So, and in many ways, I think he saw himself as trying to save Russia uh, from this totalitarian regime. And so he remains, although an exile, he does remain a patriot. This is, um, well, Jean-Luc Carré says it on the cover, the best true spy story I have ever read. Uh, the spy and the traitor is, uh, boy, is that a page turner, I think is the expression. Ben McIntyre has been our guest. This is the greatest espionage story of the Cold War. Thanks so much, Ben. Great pleasure. Thank you, Steve. The Agenda with Steve Bacon is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.